morning, everybody, and welcome to the Savvy Entrepreneur Show. If you're an entrepreneur or a small business person, or you're thinking about becoming one, this show is for you. I'm Doris Nagel, your host for the next hour. I'm a crazy entrepreneur, and I also love helping other entrepreneurs. I've counseled lots of startups and small businesses over the past 30 years, and I have seen lots of mistakes, and I've made a lot of them myself. The show really has two goals. First, to share helpful information and resources so that maybe some of you won't make some of those mistakes that I've seen or that I've made myself. The second goal is to inspire you. Hopefully make your journey as an entrepreneur faster and easier, maybe just a little bit more fun. And to help with both those goals, I have guests on the show every week who are willing to share their stories and advice. And my guest this week, and Don, I forgot to do one thing here, so I'm clapping. I forgot to ask you the pronunciation of your name. It is pronounced Rishko. Rishko. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Rishko. Okay. Here we go. And my guest this week is Dawn Rishko. She is the founder of Rishko and Associates, and she is a tax planner, something that a lot of businesses, yes, we all worry about preparing our tax returns, but maybe not so much about tax planning. And I think as you'll hear, it's a pretty important consideration and one that can leave a lot of money on the table for you or cost you dearly. So listen up. So Don, thanks so much for being with me this week. Welcome to the Savvy Entrepreneur Show. Thank you for having me. So talk a little bit about your business, first of all, and what you do and and who your clients are. Sure. So most people think of me as a CPA because I am the founder of a CPA firm, but we're a little unique in that we focus on business and tax strategy for small businesses to large businesses. And we focus on planning and cash flow and the things that really matter to the business owners. We do offer tax preparation services, but that is always secondary with the clientele we work with because they care more about the strategy. And I can't wait to talk more about that because I think that's a really important distinction. What are the demographics of your clients? Are they all over the place? (laughs) <laughs> they are. They're all U.S. based companies. OK, they do not work internationally. Tax treaties are their own little thing. <laughs> they're, they're difficult. Yeah. It's not yes, something I are. work in. Yes. So I work okay. with U.S. based businesses and, I, and uh, CPAs are allowed to cross state borders. We're very fortunate. Uh, that is interesting because I know there are a lot of professions, a lot of professional service providers like lawyers, for example, or realtors or people in healthcare that cannot. Meaning that if you have a business that has offices in Ohio, where you're based, and Wisconsin or Illinois, you're still able to help them then. Yes. And I think what may have allowed us to originally do that was sales tax, because as people started to take their business across borders, they would have had a a tax accountant in every state. It could have been problematic for the business owner. I think that's what allowed it. But I'm glad it is because it really does help when clients want to expand. I'm a lawyer by profession, and it's difficult in today's environment. You know, lawyers are licensed by state, and yet In today's world, especially with entrepreneurs and small businesses, a lot of the people are virtual and you'll have people, you kind of scratch your head over some of the ethics issues because licensing has not really kept up with what small businesses, a lot of them are doing. There's a client that has an office, he's based in Chicago, but he also spends time in Connecticut and his company's in Delaware and he has an employee in Pennsylvania and one in Florida. And it's like, wow, (laughs) what law applies? And, you know, it gets really messy with all these uh, startup businesses, a lot of whom are very virtual or have workers who are elsewhere, right? Sure. That's very common. And it would be very cumbersome, I think, in the practice of law, right? Because the business owner would need to hire attorneys in different states. They can't afford to do that, you know? Oh, that would be a 
a very difficult situation to be in. But I'm yeah. sure a lot of them are facing that. They are. And it's it's one area where licensing is, for a lot of professions, I think is really, I mean, it's true for nurse practitioners. I had a guest on the show not that long ago, and her business was telehealth. And she struggled with the licensing issue of, okay, so I have a client that's in California, and do I need to find a nurse that's licensed in California? Or it's just the licensing is not kept up. So I'm glad that the CPA profession has been a lot more progressive, should I say, because that will help your clients, I'm sure, a lot. So a lot of CPAs, in my experience, unfortunately, just do tax preparation, as you alluded to, and they really spend very little time helping their clients with tax planning. First of all, in your mind, what's the difference really between tax preparation and true tax planning? Well, anybody can prepare tax returns, believe it or not. You don't have to have a degree to do that. You don't have to have a CPA license either? You do not. I tell wow. everybody the big box firms are people off the street that go through a training course and then they're preparing your returns. Anybody could prepare a return if you simply read the instructions to a particular form. Those instructions do give you a lot of knowledge on how that form should be prepared. But that could be where their experience level ends. And I don't know, this is a general statement. For someone like myself, I also have a law degree and I focused on tax law and really learned how to manipulate it. I spent time in front of the IRS. I spent some time in court on tax cases so that I could really learn what is everyone looking at when they're coming after these businesses and saying they're doing things wrong? What are the loopholes? I spent a year in D.C., working on one tax code section. I was very fortunate to do that. But you got to see how Congress works and their staff works when they're looking to change a tax law. It was very interesting. And so with that experience and knowledge, it has helped me over my career to focus on where are the loopholes? What are the industry standards? How far can we take a particular tax position from an aggressive perspective that helps a taxpayer but that we know is also going to remain under the IRS's um, radar. So we're not breaking laws. We're just staying in the gray. In my experience, it's not even pushing the boundaries there. I mean, there are just simply things that I'll give you just a real simple example. I put my information together for the tax preparer and I neglected to, I just missed it. I neglected to put my business travel and the tax preparer didn't even ask, you know, didn't you have any travel or anything like that? They're just like garbage in, garbage out, you know? So if you didn't know you could take depreciation for something or that you were allowed to deduct something, they weren't going to ask you about it. No, and many don't because they're not obligated to. Not that I'm not giving them an excuse, but whatever contractual agreement you have with them, almost always it will state that whatever you provide them, they're allowed to use. Whereas the individuals who are out there who are considered tax uh, strategists or planners, they're going to look deeper into the numbers or from a higher level saying, what else can we do? This taxpayer owes tax. How do we eliminate that? Or minimize it. Minimize, yes. But I like the word eliminate. (laughs) Well, I love the word eliminate, but you know. (laughs) Right, but minimize, of course. And so they're just looking at the returns from a different perspective, as well as in many cases, the business, structuring your business. Yeah. Money going between the business and the business owner or other businesses. There's a lot of interplay there that can be I, you do use the word manipulated a lot because that's somewhat what we're doing. But if you tweak it right, you're planning for the taxpayer to not only save on tax dollars, but what if it improves their cash flow? Yeah. It's a win-win. Or, or the, the overall value of their business. If they're yes. interested in selling it or offering shares to an investor, right? Yes, of course. So why did you decide to focus on tax planning? I, I guess I'm curious, you know, Why do you think some CPAs are perfectly happy just to do the routine tax preparation forms 
and not step out into the more, what would seem to me, more interesting tax planning and tax strategy realm? I can only speak from my standpoint, because of course, every story is different. But to be a tax preparer is very easy. To be a strategist is a lot of work. I have to read tax law every day because it changes that frequently. And I also have a passion for law. So I don't know if others have that same passion who go into strategy, but I really find law fascinating and just how tax laws are are started, how they're changed, how Congress works. And I just, I find it absolutely fascinating enough where I spend a lot of time learning about it so that I could utilize it to help people. You're going to share with folks some amazingly valuable information, things that businesses might think about doing differently from a tax strategy and tax planning perspective, and maybe some of the money that they might be leaving on the table. Let's start with what you've seen as some of the most common misconceptions or mistakes that small businesses make about tax planning. Well, the first thing is choosing the right entity choice to run their business. That can have a huge impact on what tax you pay if you choose incorrectly for your situation. Well, give us an example or two of that. So let's say I'm going to start a small little retail establishment. I'll use an example of one here in town, an organic fruit and vegetable store. So that is considered an ordinary trader business. If the individual who created this business decided to be a sole proprietor, every dollar of taxable income is automatically going to be taxed at an additional 15.3%, which is the self-employment tax. As this business grows, and there's a lot more that hits that bottom line taxable profit number, that tax number is going to start to really hurt. Whereas if that individual would have chosen to be an S corporation, for example, the 15.3% goes away instantly. And why is that? That's because S corporation profit, even though it is taxed on your individual return, it does not subject the income to self-employment tax per the tax laws. You know, and one of the challenges is, is getting it right from the beginning. And that is difficult a lot of times for a startup business, I know, because what you think think you're going to do and how you what your business model is going to look like is not always where you actually end up, right? Correct. But with proper planning with the attorney and a, a, a tax accountant or strategist, the team, the three, you know, the business owner and those two team members could talk about these various issues. And sometimes just creating an LLC from the very beginning allows... Right the business owner to have flexibility later when their income situation or business situation changes. Right, right. And that is why the LLC form has become so popular uh, with small businesses. Talk about the uh, the advantages of an LLC. I think a lot of people think of it as sole proprietor, but it isn't necessarily. That's one of the beauties of the LLC form, right? Correct. So an LLC always provides legal liability protection. And so every attorney I've ever worked with always recommends it because you never know. And depending on the type of business you're in, um, sometimes it's a more litigious business than others. So that's why the attorneys are always on board when when we sit down. But from a, a business and tax perspective, if the LLC is owned by either one person or one individual, that LLC takes on the ownership of that particular person. So for example, if I as an individual created an LLC, it would be treated as a sole proprietorship unless right. I added other members to the LLC, other or- owners, or I made an S corporation election. So you have that option and I don't have to do that today. I can make a change any time later on. But if I have this LLC in place, it gives me a lot more flexibility as to how I do an election, especially for to an S corporation. If my yeah. entity was open as an LLC since January 1st, on December 31st, I could make it an S corporation retroactive to January 1st in the right situation. That's really helpful sometimes. And if I'm not mistaken, you can start out as a sole proprietorship 
And then let's say you decide to take on a partner, you can change the tax treatment then of the business, right? You sure can. Yes. And depending on the type of income that's coming through and the tax laws and how they affect you individually, sometimes just adding a spouse could save a lot in taxes, even if the spouse is not involved in the business. What an interesting idea. Well, that segues right into my next set of questions. And I I know you have actually spoken on this topic quite a lot and have a number of suggestions or areas that you enjoy talking to businesses about that they they don't always think about. Let's talk about some of the deductions and or credits or other tax areas that startups and small businesses might be able to take advantage of and maybe things that they haven't completely thought of. I know travel is one of them that you talk about, right? Yes. Oftentimes, I mean, travel sounds very basic to a lot of business owners, but oftentimes the business owner doesn't realize that a business travel could include some personal travel and still become a fully deductible business trip. And I can give you an example. Yeah, I do. So I'm in Ohio and let's say that there's an accounting related event that's going to be held in Las Vegas. And it's a three-day event, but I, and it's Wednesday through Friday, but I decide I'm going to stay until Sunday evening. And I'm going to have two days of personal time. Well, as long as I did go for this business trip, I will be able to take the airfare there and back, even though I'm traveling home on a Sunday, my hotel for all of those days that I'm there, Most of my food, at least for the first three days, it depends on what you do on those two personal days. But this is why you sit down with a strategist, because you want to make sure you set it up so that we can make all of that tax deductible. Well, right. So you might have a potential client that you meet at this conference and you meet them for breakfast or take them out to dinner. And then suddenly you're in, you're doing marketing and potential client discussions. That's right. And so oftentimes, as I said, a business owner doesn't realize they may think, okay, I can deduct those three days, but no. What if we could take some of those expenses from Saturday and Sunday and also create a business deduction for that? And it's worth the discussion to do that. Yeah. Or here's one of my favorites. What if my spouse, even though they may not own my company, they're one of my board of directors and there's a need for them to be there. Perhaps some or all of the costs associated with your spouse attending with you could become a tax deduction. And that's another area that I know you like to remind businesses about, and that's employing family members. So your spouse could be a board of director, but you might also have family members that are employed by the business. Talk about that a little bit. Yes. We do this for a variety of reasons, but if you have a spouse who isn't employed, it might make sense to employ them. One, to show that they are related to the company, if you want to take deductions related to that individual. Oftentimes, we employ a spouse for purposes of allowing them to participate in the retirement plan. But another person or persons to employ, which is very popular and legal, and this is where a lot of small businesses think that it's not, is employing your children. If a child is under the age of 17, you can pay them up to $13,850. Now you could pay them anything, but if you pay them up to $13,850, which is the standard deduction, and you don't have any other employees in your company besides family members, there will be no payroll taxes attributable to those wages to the children. So you're simply moving money from the business to a child Now, there has to be a real reason, and I tell people, even if they're young, photograph them, put them in advertising, talk with your strategist about this to see what would make sense for your business, but it's a wonderful way to get money into a child's account, for example, and now they can start saving for college. You could do 529 plans or just do a, you know, an account, a savings account for them. Now we have a financial advisor we can get involved to help with some planning, but the $13,850 in my example comes right off the bottom line profit of the business for tax reporting purposes, and yet the cash still remains within the family. And given how tech savvy a lot of kids are today, there's probably some real value 
not only about them learning about the business and the world of business that school doesn't always prepare them very well for, but they may be a real assistance to the business because tech help is hard to find and it's expensive. So you have a tech savvy kid that may be a, a, a nice opportunity there. It is. And a lot of people don't even think about it. It's very common for small businesses to have family members work for them, but they're working for them for free because it's a family situation. Right. right? Medical costs. That's another one I know that's a favorite topic of yours. Talk about that a little bit. Yes. So with medical expenses, I don't know how many um, small businesses tend to know that. Now, if you are incurring the cost of your own health insurance premiums, this is a fully tax deductible item in almost every situation. Now, there are some rules if you're an S corporation, and I'll share that with you. If you decide to become an S corporation to save on taxes for other reasons, the only way the health insurance would be 100% deductible is if you at least pay yourself a wage equal to the health insurance uh, as the okay. owner. Because you're, okay. it, especially if you, if you own 5% or more, but most small business owners are going to own 5% or more. But right. that needs to be part of this whole planning calculation to see if it makes sense. Okay, so it could be for you, you could hire a spouse and put them on payroll. But it's really nice because you do get to deduct 100% of the health insurance premiums without having to itemize deductions. As you probably know, since 2018, fewer and fewer taxpayers have been able to itemize because right. the standard deduction has increased so much. Right. And so many taxpayers lose out on their medical expenses. But here's one way where it's a deduction on page one of your 1040 rather than on schedule A. So it's a very nice benefit. So if you're a startup and you're not really paying yourself very much, can you still do that? If you're a sole practitioner. So here's another reason why you may want to create an LLC that you own 100%. You don't have to worry about filing any business returns. You don't have to worry about paying yourself payroll. As long as you have net profit on your Schedule C as a sole practitioner, then you would be entitled to take a health insurance deduction. Wow, that's a pretty nice benefit. It is. And yes. that's one I'm not sure that a lot of people actually know about. Because I'm sure a lot of people like me think, oh, well, that's just, you know, your medical costs. And it has to reach a pretty high amount for it to be able to be deducted on Schedule A. And yeah. what else is included in this health insurance is vision and dental. A lot of people don't think that that can be added as well. It's not just medical. It's the three of them. Nice. Okay. So home office. Now this is yes. one, interestingly enough, that my tax advisor once upon a time, I don't know what the thinking is anymore, basically said, I wouldn't do it. It's a red flag. You're just going to get audited for it. So just don't. <laughs> so what's your thoughts on that? What's the current thinking on home office? I've never thought it was a red flag. The only time that the IRS, I think, and this is my opinion, would have a problem is if you were a physician or a dentist, somebody who has to actually perform services in a medical facility. But if you truly are operating your business from your home, you are entitled to the home office deduction. And there are two different ways you can do this, but you are entitled. And I think the risk is pretty small unless, because it's based on square footage of your home, Unless you are truly using 50% of your home, I wouldn't recommend using a high percentage like that. Truly yeah. use the square footage of the space that you conduct business in. But that would be the only reason I think the IRS would be questioning you is if the percentage is ridiculously high in their viewpoint. So how does that work, though? You figure out what the rent would be for the house and then allocate. How do you well, figure sure. that out? There are two methods you can choose. So some people, because I'm going to talk about the simplified method first, some business owners don't want there to be an income calculation if they sell their home down the road. Yeah, I was going to ask you exactly about that. Mm -hmm. So there is. So under the simplified method, you look at the square footage of your home, uh, or I'm sorry, the square footage of your office space, and you're allowed $500 per square foot with a maximum deduction of $1,500 which is a nice deduction for a home office deduction. 
But most business owners, if they're working from home, will get a much higher deduction under the actual expense method. And the actual expense method, it's the square footage of the office space to the entire home. You do exclude the basement that can't, or the gar- and the garage can't be included in that calculation, which actually gives you a higher percentage to use oh, for yes, your business does. deduction. And then w- what is deductible is if you're owning your home, it's mortgage interest, property taxes, homeowner's insurance, all utilities in your home. If you have a security system, landscaping, snow service, HOA fees, all of these items are included in the calculation plus depreciation. So this is where people are getting nervous. So what you do is you look at your home, whatever the cost of your home was, there's an allocation that needs to be done between the real estate and the land. The real estate piece you take that percentage. So if your home office percentage is 10%, 10% of the cost of the real estate becomes a depreciable item and it is depreciated every year. And you want to take that deduction because if you don't, later down the road, when you sell your home, if you did not take that depreciation deduction, you have to go back and recalculate it and still calculate if you have a gain or loss. So you might as well benefit from the deductions right now. Wow. And Okay. And, and there may not be a huge gain when you sell it later. Wow. Absolutely fascinating. And then we could probably talk a long time about that. But just to make sure we hit some of the other highlights, auto, I think, is one that you like to talk with your clients about. Yes. Especially nowadays. Every one of us uses our vehicle for business. And even if you have a home based business, Do you ever leave your home to go purchase something for your business? Do you go to your attorney's office or your accountant's office, or maybe you still use the post office and you have to go there? Well, you meet with clients. That's me all the time, potential guests. I meet with people, have coffee with them, buy them coffee, buy lunch, drive to places to meet them, go to conferences and networking events where I might meet potential clients, I think all those would probably be potentially deductible, right? They all are. So every time, wherever you work, whether it's a home-based business or if you have a place of business that you go to every day, any time you leave that place of business, you get round-trip mileage at 65 and a half cents a mile to and from. That adds up over the year. And people don't always realize it. And it's one of the simplest ways. So we're going to talk about other things to do with a vehicle, but that is pretty straightforward. And there are apps out there now that are super simple. You swipe it. You swipe in one direction means it's personal mileage. You swipe the other direction, it's business. And a report can be downloaded at the end of the year that you could give to your tax preparer. Wow. It's super helpful. And it should stand up if you're ever audited because yeah. you have this documentation for all of your travel you'd be surprised how it really does make a difference as far as reducing your taxable income. Yeah. That's just the use of mileage. And then there's potentially leasing. I know that's something I do. I decided it was cost effective to lease a vehicle. Other people might find the same thing. Yes. So if you were to lease, you lease a vehicle, the optimal thing to do is to lease the vehicle in the name of the entity if you have a business entity. And if you don't, you you lease it personally. So what happens under a lease is all expenses associated with that vehicle, including the lease payments, are 100% deductible against the business income. There are calculations, though, that must be done, your tax preparer needs to do, for personal use. So if you utilize your vehicle 50% or more for personal, perhaps a lease or a purchase will not make sense because of this calculation. But if you do much driving, which a lot of salespeople do, and I, I, I still work with clients who do a lot of driving for work, or if you have a separate vehicle that you use personally, it's always nice to have two vehicles. If this were truly a 100% business use vehicle, you will see that all those deductions will add up at the end of the year as well as a business deduction. Okay, depreciation. There's another big topic. Talk about yes, that. Yes, a vehicle. Uh, depreciation of a vehicle or just depreciation in general? Well, let's start with vehicle since we're talking about that, but then 
you can transition, I think, after that into depreciation in general. Sure. So if you purchase a vehicle for your business, what's really nice is this is based on the gross vehicle weight of the vehicle. If it's less than 6,000 pounds, the first year depreciation deduction is 20,200. Now, most people, when they purchase a vehicle, finance it. So your your business is not out of pocket all that cash yet. You're going to pay it over, let's say, five years. Right. But in the year that you actually receive the vehicle. So let's say that you bought it in the fourth quarter of the year. But as long as you have possession of the vehicle by December 31st, you'll get that $20,200 wow. as a tax deduction. It's very nice. It adds up. And what is even better is if the vehicle weighs more than 6,000 pounds, There's a thing out there called bonus depreciation people have been talking about the last few years. And you can take 80% of the purchase price as a deduction in the first year, even if you haven't paid for it yet. Wow. Aren't there some deductions too for electric vehicles these days? Those are tax credits. So tax credits are different. So the depreciation deduction is a deduction against the business income. The tax credit is a credit that actually dollar for dollar will reduce the tax that you owe. Ah, that's not specific to business, but if you have a business, does that play out differently? Well, you could take both. There's a good chance you you might benefit for both. You need to look at that, right? Because the vehicle itself gets depreciated. These tax credits are an energy credit that's given by the government for certain vehicles. Wow. Very Mm -hmm. cool. Okay, folks, jot down the name of your tax planner and call them now. Or if you don't, call Dawn. (laughs) Lots (laughs) of potential there. Okay, so then there's also depreciation on other kinds of things like business equipment and I I don't know, inventory maybe? I don't know. Yeah, so anything that you purchase for your business that would be considered an asset, I am sorry, I have to use some of these accounting terms. I'll give you an example. Every business owner I know owns some type of computer, whether it be a desktop or a laptop, right? Yeah. That is considered an asset. And under the Internal Revenue Code, you have a few options of how you want to depreciate this. A a computer, for example, can be depreciated over five years straight line if you want, where you just take one fifth of it each year. I don't recommend that. You could take this bonus depreciation I just discussed with the vehicle where it's 80% of the cost in the first year and the remaining 20% in this example would be depreciated over the next four years. Or you could take a section 179 deduction. That is an internal revenue code section, but that is exactly how the IRS refers to it uh, on the tax return. And so the section 179 deduction is a full write-off in the first year for the cost of this computer. You have to have profit in your business to take the Section 179. So if I bought a computer for $1,000, my profit would have to be at least $1,000 to benefit versus the bonus depreciation. I could have no profit in my business and I still get 80% right off and create a tax loss for my business. Nice. So it's important to look at both when you're working with your tax preparer or advisor. Uh, wow. Wow. I have a lot of notes to uh, to talk with my tax accountant about here. <laughs> um, what about retirement plans? I know that's another topic you enjoy I do. With your business clients. I like retirement plans because if you plan it right, and sometimes it's not for the first year, maybe you have to be in business a couple of years where there's enough profit, but if they're structured the right way, you could create a tax loss while putting money into your pocket instead of Uncle Sam's. And that's what I love about these. Okay. So, you got to, you got to <laughs> share a little more detail about that. Right. So we can start with the basic. Every business owner should at least consider if there's at least cash flow in their business, setting up a traditional or Roth IRA for themselves and a spouse. Traditional IRAs are are easier to obtain a tax deduction for. But even if your income is at a high level and you don't qualify to contribute to a Roth, a backdoor Roth is a beautiful way to get money into Roth, into a Roth plan. Um, And that you just work with your financial advisor on. So that's just a basic and anybody who has earned income. And what that means is either a W-2 or self-employment income 
should qualify for an IRA. Um, that would be the first taxpayer, and then a spouse can join in on that. The business type of retirement plans are a simple IRA, a SEP, which is a simplified employee pension, or a 401k. 401ks are my favorite, but you need to have enough business income to make it worth your while. What these three plans do is they're considered employer plans or the business itself sets up these plans. For a simple IRA, a SEP or a 401k, you have to have employees and including yourself. As a business owner, you need to be an employee. Now, if you are self-employed and file a Schedule C because you're considered a sole proprietor, you can qualify for all three of these plans. It's a, um, a slightly different calculation within your personal return, but the tax limits are still the same. And so, wow. um, yes, and where the 401k, why I like the 401k is because the 401k is usually the plan we use to put the most money possible aside for the business owners, hopefully create a tax loss or very little taxable income. Not pay Uncle Sam, but we have a bunch of cash that's put aside for the future. And then, of I, course, if you create any of these three, the simple IRA or the SEP or the 401k, as a business owner, there is a tax credit. It's $5,000 maximum credit for the first three years. And as I said previously, a tax credit is dollar for dollar off your income, income tax, excuse wow. me, your income tax. So it may make sense if you have some profit and you're paying taxes and you're not comfortable paying taxes who wants to pay taxes right um, and if if you have the cash flow in your business it may make a lot of sense to sit down with your tax preparer or advisor and a, a certified financial planner or a wealth advisor and yeah. figure out which one of these may be the best benefit for you because again no two taxpayers are the same <laughs> Wow, I think it should be becoming clear to my listeners what can be achieved through tax planning as opposed to just here's some numbers, here's a you know, here's my here's my tax planner, I'm filling out a few things, I'm putting in a few numbers, but most of these these tax questionnaires that you fill out don't get to this kind of stuff at all. You know, yes, they're more of a checklist to make sure that you haven't missed any documents to provide to your preparer. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so, by the time you're sitting with them to prepare your returns, a lot of the things that we're talking about, it may be too late to implement for the year that they're filing a return for. That's absolutely right. I mean, you know, they send this out and it's it's late February or it's March or or you know, somewhere in there. And by then the tax year's over. You can't do any planning at that point or very, very little, very, yeah, very little. little. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, one other topic that I know is something you are passionate about are financing considerations. Yes. Talk a little bit about that. Well, many business owners don't realize the importance of being bankable. <laughs> And you want to be bankable before you need the bank, right? So I always tell somebody, especially in the early startup phases, there are, at least that I know of, eight different ways that you can obtain financing for your business. And you want to think this through and, and work this with the strategist to make sure it's the right way for you. But what's really important is you want to have access to cash, be it a equity line of credit in your business or even a credit card with a high limit, perhaps, that you could utilize because you have ebbs and flows in a business. Right. And it's important to do that. And sometimes, you know, depending on how you receive payments from your customers or clients, um, there could be a lag. Yeah, and there's so often, I think, especially with um, with startup businesses, there's often a cash flow problem. You know, you just yes. don't, you're not getting paid at the same rate that you're spending. That's right. And even though most business owners know they have to have some skin in the game with their own finances, it may not be sufficient, but there are ways to get money. <clears throat> Sometimes it's simply, I mean, some of the free money are these crowdfunding and the uh, grants that you could obtain, but most people have to go through either they take a home equity line of credit on their house which we could talk about. They get an SBA loan 
Um, I always recommend getting a credit card. Or, and to obtain a business line of credit, you usually have to be in business a year or two. All banks are different, but that is what I've seen over my career. The banks are looking for two solid years of financial reporting before they'd give a line of credit. But yeah. that doesn't mean you can't get an SBA loan right out of the gate. Right, 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 right. And there's also non-bank lending, too. Uh, that's usually more expensive, but it's it's certainly out there for for some. Oh yes, they need. Uh, I work with a lot of people who use a self directed retirement account money to lend to certain types of businesses, and it is at a higher interest rate. But if you're the one doing the lending, it's really a nice way to put more money into your retirement account. So it can be win win for both sides. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. So, um, there's you've got to have a story or two, maybe on a no name basis, of how tax planning has made a significant difference in their bottom line or in the quality of their business numbers. Yes. Um. Well. I, well, the first and most important thing I have found with my clients that I've worked with is cash flow is everything. And they don't, re, you know, they don't always think they need to talk about that with their tax person, but you right. do because the taxes have a direct impact and you can't get out of it. If you owe, there's been no planning, you you owe and you have to come up with the cash. Right. And so I have found that if we can put something in place, it could be just one of the items we talked about, or there's many others. And it's reducing your taxable income. Now you know that that cash that's in your bank account can be used for the next month or the next six months or future planning um, that the business has. So, you know, they need to buy some equipment or maybe they want to buy a vehicle because the vehicle makes sense. So that's important. But well, I've I, also... Oh, oh yes, sorry. go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm just oh, no, please there, go ahead. <laughs> I'm guessing there are situations where people actually thought they owed money but once they or would owe money, but once they sat down with you or their tax strategist, found that they might even have a refund coming back. Yes. And that's the best story ever. Or what um what I find to be a lot of fun, and I'm sure other tax prepare um planners do as well, is I sit with all of our clients in the fall and we do some strategic planning. And the fun part for me is, okay, let's assume that we determine the taxpayer is going to owe two grand. All right. Well, now I have until April 15th to get rid of that. And that's my own personal challenge. The <laughs> taxpayer <laughs> believes they're going to write a check for two grand. So as long as it doesn't exceed two grand, they are happy. They already know what it's going to be. And it's a really nice situation when I can sit down with them and say, well, it's only 500. Yeah. Wow. Yes, indeed. That's, that's music to any business person's ears. Um, how do you find a good tax planner? I mean, even if I, everybody's not going to call you, and even if they did, you probably would not know what to do. <laughs> so, you know, how do you find, and some people love just actually being able to sit down face to face with their tax planner. Of course. How That's important. You, yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you, how should, do you recommend they go about finding somebody who's the right fit for them? Well, the first thing you should do is almost every business owner has people that, that they know in their circle that have businesses, ask them who they're working with. And if they're, that person is doing it, you know, word of mouth referrals are always the best, but if you're just starting out and you're, you need to interview people, once you find some people online, you know, Hopefully their website will give you some information as to the fact that they're a strategist or a planner. But if not, if it's, you know, John Doe CPA in your neighborhood and you said this is close and I'll be able to meet with them, call them. And you want to ask them questions. How many times a year will I interact with you? Do you only prepare my returns? Come right out and ask that. Or do you also provide year round planning? Can I call you if I'm if something comes up in my business and I need to discuss with you? A perfect example that we hear a lot of our from our clients is, do I buy my car, lease my car? I'm going to the dealership this week. Well, let's look at it. I mean, that's an important decision, right? Right. right. And so um, 
you want to ask this person that you're going to start working with if they do that. And then also ask them, you want to ask them how many IRS audits have they had? And if they have had any, um, what was their success rate in winning? Too. That's very wow, important too, because question. if you're going to be with somebody who's coming up with tax planning ideas, you trust us, but you also don't want us to constantly be in court, you know, tax court or dealing with IRS audits because we're way too aggressive. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Those are great, great questions. You know, it occurs to me, there may be some areas where businesses take deductions that they maybe shouldn't take. Are there any of those that you see fairly commonly? Yes. It depends on the industry you're in. Uh, but please don't ever take any deductions for your clothing <laughs> unless it is truly a uniform. So some people will buy, um, I'll give you an example, polo shirts, and they'll put the company logo on the shirt. That is fine. That would be construed as a uniform. Okay. But just because you have to look beautiful every day, the government doesn't care and you will lose on that. The same with doing your nails and your hair. Unless you're an entertainer, there's special rules for them. Please don't do that because if you get caught, no one can help you. You will lose. And that that's what I see a lot. <laughs> wow. That surprised me. That's actually kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I would love to make sure people have your website and your contact information so that they can reach out to you if they're interested in getting more information or maybe connecting with you. Sure. I'd be glad to help anyone. My website is cleveland-cpa.com or you can reach me at dawn at cleveland-cpa.com. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, um, I hope people do take advantage of it because it's very clear after talking, even just spending a few minutes with you, that there are almost certainly some things that maybe are worth talking with a tax strategist about that really might benefit your business, either in payment of taxes or even, as you said, Dawn, in cash flowing the business, right? Yes. Well, I want to absolutely thank you for a fascinating interview. I mean, I learned a lot and I'm sure my listeners did too. Dawn, thank you so much for being on the show this week and for sharing so much valuable information with my listeners. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate being asked to, to speak with you. It's been fun. And thanks to all the listeners. You're the reason I do this show. You can find helpful information and resources on my website, the savvyentrepreneur.org. There is a library there of blogs, there's tools, there is a archive of all kinds of past episodes of the show with tons just tons of guests. I've been doing the show now for about four years and the number of people who are advisors to small businesses who have been generous, generous in sharing their advice and insights on how to make your business more profitable and, and uh, ways to grow your business more successfully, as well as stories from amazing, amazing entrepreneurs. So I encourage you to go there and take a listen to some of the past episodes. And if you prefer YouTube, yes, there are people and lots of them who actually like listening to podcasts on demand from YouTube. I have a channel called the Savvy Entrepreneur Radio Show. And so go there, download the shows, like them, comment on them. Be sure to subscribe so that you're notified of new episodes as they're posted. You'll be supporting an amazing, amazing community of entrepreneurs just like you. Thanks again for listening. Be sure to join me again next week at 11 a.m. Central Time on Saturday, where I have another great guest and topic. But until then, I'm Doris Nagel, wishing all of you happy entrepreneuring.